Hi, this is Nick Pizai. This is another video in our series of advanced topics for water treatment plant operators. Okay, we're going to talk about G value calculations. I'll share this screen with you. And we'll launch into our topic. There we go. We're working too well so far. <laughs> Okay, understanding and calculating G values, part of the advanced math for water plant operators. In order to understand uh, how G values can be used to optimize our water treatment, uh, we want to review first uh, the concept of conventional water treatment. When uh, water professionals use the term conventional water treatment, they mean it's a system using major unit processes, including rapid mix with uh, a coagulant, flocculation, Sedimentation, of course, filtration with granular media units, and disinfection with usually a chlorine or something along those lines. So other types of treatment like lime softening and ion exchange, membranes, that kind of, kind of thing, is a different kind of treatment, specialized treatment process, not considered conventional. The thing about conventional is that all these processes have design parameters attached to them. If you follow them, if you keep within those parameters, you should do okay with your water treatment. So it's helpful to understand each of the components. And today we're gonna to talk about one of those components. Uh, those design parameters, by the way, follow widely accepted engineering standards. And so as operators, we should understand what those standards are so that we can keep within those parameters. So conventional water treatment with coagulants and rapid mixing, or rather mechanical mixing. In a conventional treatment plant, Operators typically add mechanical energy to the water to improve coagulation and flocculation processes. Uh, this energy input is typically accomplished through the use of motorized agitators or, or impellers. Uh, the tank that they're going to mix in is going to be a fixed tank. It's going to be a fixed volume, doesn't change. Water flows through it, and we put energy input into the rapid mixture flocculators by the use of these motorized impellers. Uh, the energy input or G value is relatively violent and short in rapid mixing. Uh, here, uh, we're trying to create the flock particles from scratch by adding the coagulant in there, and we wanna make sure that the coagulant gets dispersed to all corners of the, of the, uh, of the unit itself. We wanna make sure that every drop of water gets its share of coagulant. But we don't wanna be in there too long. We don't wanna break up these things, but on average, we're gonna be in there less than a minute or so. The energy input in flocculation now is relatively low, but longer in duration in, in the flocculator. And typically it's gonna be tapered as we move through the unit. At the beginning, it's a little bit higher energy. By the time we work our way to the end of the flocculator, it's lower energy. Here, we're trying to provide opportunities for the flock particles that we've created in mixing to start to collide with one another. And the more opportunity they have to do that, um, the better they're going to have an opportunity to, to stick to each other once they collide with each other. So the energy input by the mechanical mixture that we put in there provides greater opportunity for them to bounce into one another. It also helps in the last compartment to have enough uh, gentle agitation going so that the particles, which are now becoming heavier and denser, don't settle to the bottom prematurely before they get to the um, sedimentation basis. So typically, we're going to be here less than 45 minutes or so. As stable colloidal particulate contaminants pass through these processes, and I'm gonna talk about stability here in a little bit, they become destabilized and conditioned properly for settling and filtration. So we need to understand the concepts of stabilization and destabilization. How do engineers use these terms in water treatment? Let's understand that as operators. These are two terms that scientists use to describe the rates and effectiveness of particle aggregation and flock formation. And here's a quote I'll share with you that I got out of the AWWA Water Quality Book. The object of destabilization is to transform a stable suspension, that is one that is resistant to aggregation or attachment to a filter grain, to an unstable one. So we're going to go from stable to unstable. I know that sounds counterintuitive. When I first heard it, I thought that can't be right, but it is. A stable suspension is what we normally find in, in surface water supplies in Mother Nature we wanna make it unstable in order to treat it properly. So that quote, which I found in the textbook is supposed to tell us that the bad stuff that we find in lakes and reservoirs probably has been there for months, maybe years. 
and it exists as stable, discrete units, each of those little particles that we want to take out, all that, those bad particles, Giardia, crypto, uh, clay particles, anything that's in there that adds to the general turbidity of the water, these are discrete units that tend to stay stable unless we change them somehow. If we don't change them, they're not going to they're not going to be taken out of the water very easily. So we make those particles unstable by mixing in a coagulant. We destabilize them. We encourage them to start sticking together and growing a bigger bigger particles that are going to settle and be filtered. So let's revisit the important components of conventional pre-treatment processes before filtration. Coagulation and flocculation processes in conventional treatment are largely dependent on these factors. The temperature of the water. We know that in summertime when the water is warmer on, on a surface water plant, it's a lot easier to make chemical reactions go to, go to their endpoints, a lot easier to settle the water. Uh, just things work better in, in the warmer temperatures. Alkalinity and pH and other raw water chemical, physical, and biological characteristics are going to have a large important uh, effect on the uh, conventional pretreatment process, of course. Use of the correct coagulant at the correct dose for those raw water characteristics that we just uh, characterized are going to be important. Of course, we would use alum or ferric chloride or polyaluminum chloride. Uh, we have to use that. It's got to be the correct one for us, and it's got to have the correct dosage attached to it. Of course, we have to have sufficient detention time and energy input, or what we call the G value, and that's what we're talking about today as we get along. The, the important uh, value that is used in rapid mixing and flocculation, the amount of energy that we're putting in there. And of course, we have to have sufficient settling time and proper configuration of surface area and overflow rates in our sedimentation basins. And of course, any other treatment chemicals if used. So those are the important components, or most of the important components for conventional pretreatment processes. So let's talk about one of them, mixing itself, mixing process. We use mixing in conventional water treatment to make sure that the coagulant gets dispersed evenly and quickly in the raw water, as I mentioned. In order to do that, of course, we've got to have very powerful mixers that perform that job in just a few seconds, as I mentioned, 30 seconds or so, really less than, less than a minute. We also use mixing in our plants to provide opportunities for particles to aggregate, to collide with one another and stick together. So they grow in size and become dense, and that's what flocculation is. Of course, to do that, we use less powerful mixtures than we did in rapid mix, but we do that over a longer period of time, say 30 minutes or 45 minutes. And during that period of time, we're putting uh, a larger amount of energy in the beginning of the compartment of the flocculator, and as we go through, we're, we're downsizing that energy and put that G value as we go through. So it's useful for operators to be able to quantify the amount of energy, to be able to put a number on that, to, to, to put a number to the G value so that we can compare the energy in one component as opposed to the other component. How much energy, how much G value is in this compartment of the flocculator versus the last compartment, that kind of thing. So G value just gives us an opportunity to, to talk numbers to each other to make, make sense and we all understand. So they, that's what they did. They, they coined the term G value to describe this relative power. Basically, the larger the G value, the more powerful the mixing energy that you're putting into the system. So G values in operations looks a little bit like this. As operators, we don't need to have an engineer's level of understanding of G value, but there probably are a few things that we ought to know. For conventional rapid mixing, G values are normally going to be in the 700 to 1,000 range, certainly in triple digits somewhere up in their higher range. <clears throat> and maybe even higher for inline mixers. Now, in some of your older water treatment plants, I'm talking earlier than 1980s, uh, you might have a lower G value mixer. This was because engineers didn't have a good grasp, or as good a grasp on G value importance that they do today. So they didn't tend to uh, install, design and install very large mixers back then. But you might have an even smaller one in rapid mixing. For conventional flocculation, G values may typically be at near 100 as you're coming to the entrance of the flocculator, and they may taper down all the way to 10 or 20 or so in the final compartment. And last compartment, as I, as I mentioned, is important. We've got to keep enough energy going into the system to continue the flocculation process and not allow the particles to settle out prematurely in the flocculator. We want them to carry over into the sed basin, so we need some energy there. If your water treatment plant has variable rate mixing capability in flocculation, then all of the operators should learn how to use that valuable tool. 
that tool can either hurt you or help you. And it's important that all operators understand how to vary the speed of the flocculator drive so that they get optimum treatment. They should understand that you just don't set it and forget it. You know, let it run at the same speed all year round. There are reasons that things change. And that's what we're gonna to try to discover today. So what parameters are used for G calculation? If you, if you can understand these parameters that go into the calculation for G value, then you'll understand why it's important to be able to control what you're doing in the plant. So G value is a function of the volume of the mixer box, which we designate as V, volume of the tank in cubic feet. So the, the rapid mixer and the flocculators, of course, they're gonna have a fixed volume once they're constructed for you. You're not gonna be able to change that. But the size of them is very important. You need to know the volume. The density of the water, and we can take that to be 62.4 pounds per gallon. We're gonna designate that as W. Uh, the number of revolutions per second in the mixer, we're going to designate that as N. Revolutions per second, not a minute. The diameter of the impeller, impeller in feet, designated as D. So for a rapid mixer, it may be one or two or two and a half, three feet. But of course, for the flocculator, it's going to be a pretty wide system. Maybe in, our, in the example I'm going to give you, as much as 12 feet. Gravity, of course, something you can't change, but it's working uh, to be part of the uh, G calculation. And that's fixed at 32.2 feet per second squared. And the viscosity of water, which is designated as this uh, little U, which ranges from about, I think, 3.23 or so at, at the lower temperatures to 3.23 times 10 to the minus 5 or 0 0.00003233, all the way up to, um, and I forgot to put a number in there, but um, I would say up to 0.188 at much higher temperatures. So we'll, we'll work on that in the calculation. Uh, and of course, the power input of the mixing system itself, which is affected by several factors, the size of the motor, the number and the angle of the impeller blades, that's very important. We won't get into too much of that today, but that, you know, that's called pitch and the number of revolutions per second of blades, et cetera. So let's look at the G value itself. And we're gonna uh, use again, the Aquarius flocculator compartment. Uh, we're gonna use the last compartment of one of their flocculators. And again, we, we thank the Lake County Department of Utilities for their, their uh, gracious uh, use of our of their water plant uh, to help operate our education. We appreciate that. Uh, given the following information, let's calculate G value for the last flocculator compartment, one of the Aquarius flocculators, and using this formula. And you see there that G equals the square root of the power input divided by V and U. V is the volume of the tank, and U is the viscosity of the water. So that that kind of makes sense. We're gonna we're gonna take the square root of the power of the power that we're putting into the system that is spread out over the volume of the tank and is affected by the viscosity of the water, whether it's colder or warm water. Now that P is where things get a little bit more complicated. The the, the power input that we're putting into the system is going to equal K divided by G. K is a, an impeller constant. We're gonna assume that to be one in our example, but it, you have to get those out of the engineering books or you have to get it out of the um, given to you when your equipment was put into your plant. Um, we're going to divide that, that impeller constant, K, divided by gravity, 32.2 feet per second. We're going to multiply all that times the uh, weight of water, 62.4, the density of water, 62.4 pounds per cubic foot, times the revolutions per second. And in this case, I'm going to take 0 0.05 and to the third power. And the impeller diameter, which is 12 feet, or a flocculator, this is big paddles that um, extend off of the central rod that, that goes through the middle of the flocculator. And the, the volume of the compartment is uh, 470.5 cubic feet and the P sub W of course is the power input to the system. So at this point, I'm going to share, we'll stop sharing this screen. Go with a new share. If I can find it here, yes. This is a little spreadsheet I put together just to do a simple calculation. So on the left-hand side of the spreadsheet, you see a, a light blue box, which is the power input calculation, and the light green boxes, which is the overall G value, which right now is set at 63. Just remember, this is the last compartment of the flocculator. So all the values we have that go into the equation are the impeller constant, I'm assuming to be one. The gravity is 32.2. The water density is 62.4. But now we come to two boxes that are colored uh, pale yellow, which is the viscosity of the water, and that can change. 
That's what it is at about 40 degrees. I'm gonna change it to a summertime temperature to show you what that looks like. Then of course the revolutions per second of the impeller, which I've set at 0.05. And the diameter of the impeller assembly for this flocculator was 12 feet, as I mentioned. Of course, the volume of the mixing unit itself was about 470.5 cubic feet for that unit. When we put all that in and we calculate, we get a G value of 63, which is about as high as it can get for that last compartment. It's a little too high for what we want, but it's as high as it can get. So we see that and we think, well, let's, let's slow that down. Let's slow the revolutions per second of the impeller down to say 0.03. We're going to slow that down a little bit because it is, is going to be uh, a little bit too fast for us to be up at 63. So let's just put in a 0.03. Watch what happens to the green box on the left. Now we go down to 29 or 30, which makes more sense for the last compartment. But we're not going to have our operator run that at the max speed, which you saw when I first brought that up. Let me, let me get out of that a minute and show you. The 0.05 was about as fast as that last compartment uh, paddle can move, according to the manufacturer. We don't want to run it that high. But we put it down to 0.03 we got a more realist, realistic speed. Of course, if we control the speed of that last compartment, the other ones before it will take care of themselves. Let's also see what happens if I change the viscosity of water to something more like uh, warmer water temperatures. This is 3.3 times, 3.23 times 10 to the minus 5, which was the viscosity that I got online, which is dynamic viscosity, not kinematic viscosity. Dynamic viscosity of water at 40 degrees Fahrenheit. If you look up in the tables for water at say 76, which is about what Lake Erie can get up to, you see a 1.88 times and then a minus five. So let me put that in there and see what happens to the green box. Notice how it changes. Oops, I get the wrong number there, sorry. Wrong number, my apologies. Now the green box went up from went up to about a 38 from a lower number. You notice in the summertime, when the water is warmer, the same rotation of that paddle, nothing else has changed except the, the, the viscosity of the water because it's warmer. The amount of energy input grows because I was able to do the same job in warmer water rather than colder water. So the warmer the water, the more G value you have. That's why it's important for operators to understand that if they got warmer water, I don't need to run those paddles as fast perhaps. Maybe I do for other reasons, but for temperature alone, I should be able to at least slow down a little bit. Now, of course, if I have heavy uh, turbidity coming in, I don't want to slow down too much because I'll prematurely settle a fog bar. So running, running a flocculator is, uh, is something that takes a lot of experience. Operators need to understand the control they have. And if they don't, under, if they don't understand these things and do the wrong thing, they're going to have some problems for themselves too. So those are things that we can understand and work together. So with that, I'm going to get back out. Go back to sharing the screen with you. Let me stop sharing this. And go back to the last slide. And hopefully you got something out of this today. I know this is an advanced topic. Let's go to this slide here. I remind you that this concludes the video, but this is one of the advanced topic of water treatments. Um, there are other uh, series that we've got going. We've got basic math and we've got applied math. This was the advanced math. So there's three different channels you can look into. So at the end of this video, you can push the button that comes up on your screen on the lower left that has an N in it, I think. If you want to subscribe to these, uh, just click on that button and that'll give you instant uh, access to these other videos as they become available. The button on the right uh, will bring you to another series of videos that you can click on and go to those if you want to continue watching. But with that, again, I appreciate this. I uh, hope these videos are helping. If you have any questions, um, you can always email me at nick at aqsrv.com, which will show up on another box. So check back often. We'll see more videos as they come up. Thank you.